here and is now entrepreneuring here. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, higher authority with robotics. Really interested to hear this talk. Go. Um, hello, everyone. Just starting off with a, a question. Um, there are two possible answers, so you can abstain if neither of these apply. Um, I was just wondering who's more interested in Star Trek or more interested in Star Wars? So, Star Trek, raise your hands. Be proud. 10, 15, 15 maybe? Which one? Yeah. You gotta pick, sorry, you gotta pick. You're most famous. So, Star Trek, sorry, Star Trek again. Babylon 5. Star Wars, Star Wars. Battlestar Galactic. Well, it's pretty evenly split. Anyway, um, the reason I asked, so Peter Till gave a comment that everyone who started with him at PayPal uh, was more interested in Star Wars, and apparently, I don't know, it's more capitalist or something, and they thought Star Trek was a bit communist, so they were like, capitalist entrepreneurs, Star Wars. <laughs> so yeah. <coughs> anyway, um, I had thought that Robotics is a company we've been around uh, a year and three months now. And it started, I won an international prize, the, uh, the IAC's, <coughs> or an a additional event to the IAC, they run a, a competition called the Move an Asteroid Competition. And I won that and I thought, oh, I, I've got this validation, I can commercialize it. Thought I had a customer uh, straight away, or I thought I would have customers. Turned out it wasn't the case, because um, the customers were also startups who were like, we want customers, we don't want to be customers. So, uh, interesting scenario that. But basically, our whole mission is enabling uh, space exploration missions of the future, because this is what inspired us uh, to get involved in the, in the space community. Um, so just talking about the big problem that we see, and I think this is true for everyone. So Falcon 9, everyone thinks that's pretty efficient, and it is. Um, but only 4% of the launch mass that goes to low Earth orbit is payload, uh, which is tiny. So 96% of that is either fuel or structure that enables that to take off. And it's mainly because of the huge change in velocity that's required. So, you know, give or take, but roughly about nine kilometers per second of delta B is required to get that to lower Earth orbit. Um, so just a note, when it goes to GTO, so geosynchronous transfer orbit, um, where, where it puts the big birds, only 0.7% of the spacecraft is payload. Um, this number is a little sketchy. This morning when I was uh, putting these slides together, I was like, so what's an A380 like? Um, so I just took out the, the payload of an A380, which is passengers and cargo, and it turns out 16% is payload, but then they've got a lot of other infrastructure as well, like seats, I don't know if they were included, but windows are also a big thing, uh, adds a lot of structure onto aircraft. They've got a lot of control services as well, so maybe it's more close to 30% for the A380 once we account for all of that. We don't uh, include Earth-based transport, so that's you know, getting to site moving all the fuel around. Uh, in the US, there's a huge supply chain involved for uh, getting, getting rockets put together. So the solution, it's obvious. Just use stuff that's already up there, right? Because there's a lot of, a lot of uh, big masses. Uh, there's the moon, which is 10 to the tw 22 kilograms. That's huge. Let's use that. Or there's heaps of asteroids that are floating about as well. And if we use stuff that's up there already, then we don't need that nine kilometers per second delta V. Um, the amount of delta V is like much lower, usually uh, around three to four kilometers per second instead. And due to logarithmic laws, uh, it's a huge difference in terms of ma uh, useful mass that you can get to, a, to an area. So taking a little back step. Uh, going to the hero team. I'm the only one here today, which sucks. There's a lot of we're doing a lot of stuff at the moment, including me finishing my PhD. Um, so I'm the 0.9 there, the 3.9, almost finished. So come bring it on. <laughs> um, but we've got three other PhDs as part of the co-founding team. And we've got a whole bunch of degrees. Um, and I thought we'd I'd blow us up today because uh, I thought this was pretty cool. And um, we've got if, if two of us have had experience in other startups. One's valued at 50 million. The other's at 300 million, which is pretty crazy. I didn't even think about that till today. 
Um, and also, I've, I come from a project engineering management background, and I've uh, managed projects with uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 million dollars. And our, our whole thing is that we want to pursue game-changing ideas. So at the moment, we're taking a bit of a back step and thinking about if what we're doing is game-changing, and if not, we want to do something that is. And we're, we're pretty keen to help other people uh, achieve that as well. <coughs> so looking at our niche. <coughs> so we're really excited about asteroids. Um, and yes, our, our first people that we thought were customers uh, are the asteroid mining companies, specifically DSI, I know there's um, someone from there today. Uh, but pretty quickly we found out not, not particularly interested in what we had to offer. So there are about 53 asteroids, or there, there were 53 asteroids that we know of that passed the Earth last year, closer than the Moon. The actual number is much higher than that. We have huge problems observing <coughs> these guys. Um, and they range in size from uh, a few meters across, probably about as big as this screen, uh, to about 50 meters across, so bigger than this complex of buildings that we're in right now. Uh, so ranging from you know reasonably smallish to very very big. And uh, getting to these particular asteroids has a, a lower energy cost, so that's the delta V problem, um, because you're staying in the Earth Moon system. Uh, you can do a flyby mission of these uh, for reasonably cheap in terms of energy. And the, t the time cost is incomparable. So if you're going no further than the moon, then, uh, and you're, you're starting from a, a holding orbit near to the Earth, then your time cost is always less than uh, 15 days, so two weeks. So compared to a, an asteroid mission that takes 10 years to complete, <coughs> it's ridiculously less, which is awesome. Um, and this, this is a little diagram, sorry about the crackiness, I took this from a, an old old slide, but it, it gives you an idea of, of what happens. So you've got your spacecraft, spacecraft on a holding orbit, that's the little red one there, and then it loops out on, a, on an elliptic orbit. Uh, I've got the, the moon orbit tinier than it today, but it would be within the moon orbit. And then it intercepts an asteroid as the asteroid passes through the uh, plane the 2D plane that the uh, spacecraft is staying on. The whole idea is that you, you don't plane change because that costs a lot of delta V for those that you know. <clears throat> All right, so looking at a spacecraft that can do those kinds of things, it looks pretty standard. That's, that's a picture of a 50 kilogram concept there. So it kind of <coughs> looks like a CubeSat, but it's a bit, quite a bit bigger. <coughs> Uh, and yeah, it just looks like a standard spacecraft. There's not really much special about it. And quickly we were like, okay, so what are we doing that's different even? We're not really doing much that's different. And that, that's probably a good thing. We don't really want to uh, remake the wheel, which is good. So the, the main challenge is that though, is that we need a lot more delta V than uh, most missions that stay in cislunar space. That's the space between Earth and um, so the way that we address that was by looking into using uh, batteries combined with an electric thruster. So uh, everyone knows that electric thrusters are super efficient. Um, you can throw out mass really, really fast out the back of your <coughs> spacecraft. And so you get this huge impulsive efficiency. And already uh, a few spacecraft are using batteries to <coughs> really pump uh, really pump the energy to get out of GTO into GEO real quick, um, but they do it at a, a low a low scale, I would say, and that's because they only do it once, uh, whereas we might need multiples of these. And so, are we are we the test sort of space? Yeah, <coughs> uh, I don't know. I'll play it. I'll play it. Um, and usually thruster development focuses, focuses on efficiency, so uh, Newman Space has a really efficient thruster, which is great. The problem is that it then takes longer to uh, get out of one orbit and into another one. Um, so what we did was uh, focus on uh, getting these batteries and then you can burn uh, your engine for a shorter period of time and then you actually increase orbital efficiency. So if you're spiraling out of an orbit, 
you actually have a lot of unused delta V that you're uh, pushing into that spacecraft. And it's super inefficient. Uh, sorry, I don't have any numbers here, but uh, you can save uh, on a transfer from low Earth orbit to geo, you can save uh, up to a kilometer per second delta V, which is humongous. And it, it can uh, uh, help with time as well. Uh, so just a quick idea of how we increase the orbital efficiency. So usually when you're spiraling out, you're thrusting behind you the whole time. So you're using this energy to change the shape uh, of the orbit, and it's continuously changing the shape. So what we do is uh, try and limit the shape change to a very small portion of our orbit orbit. So it's only burning during this little phase here, and we can slowly burn out at greater ellipses uh, until we uh, get to our final ellipse. And uh, when you compare to uh, single impulse rockets, or rockets that we assume have a uh, minuscule impulse, uh, going from here to here is the same delta V as the addition of going from here to here, then here to here, and so on. Hope that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so going to a demonstrated mission, uh, launching a 50 kilogram spacecraft, pretty expensive, um, and uh, yeah, fun funding can be an issue, but we've got an idea for a 3D demonstrator. Uh, to demonstrate this technology. And we could either have a little target that we launch uh, beforehand that, that we then approach uh, using this technique, or we could uh, get up to uh, some known orbital debris. And we have a very conservative estimate, actually. Uh, we've gone higher rather than lower, like most people do. And we uh, have estimated that it will cost less than $800,000. That includes everything, including uh, launch costs, and also uh, paying people, paying for the systems, etc. Okay. And uh, this system has to be a little bit different <coughs> from normal ion thrusters, largely the thermal dump. So because you're burning a lot of energy in a small amount of time, uh, your thermals uh, need to be able to take care of that. So usually, usually you've got a, a small uh, thermal dump on a spacecraft, and now it has to be that's everything. Thanks awesome. a lot, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Right on time. Are there any questions? Yes, Ian, and then your second. How much power are you finding to store of those batteries? Uh, I, I don't have any <coughs> sorry. Um, but it's quite a lot. I can tell you the size of the batteries. It's around 12 kilos in that 50 kilo, kilogram spacecraft. So it's pretty much the flying battery. So it's pretty, pretty huge. And you, you run it the whole effect thrust. Not, not whole effect, actually. It's probably um, more of a gridded iron thruster. Uh, so, for different reasons, I can discuss those. Uh, sure. Yeah, after. Yep. Okay, we had another question. So, with this slide in particular here, um, what is your objective when you reach that intercept point? Because you're going to be moving at a, <coughs> quite a different speed to the asteroid. <coughs> and just to, to fly by and grab down quickly, because I, I felt that you had a focus on. Flying exploration, yeah, and you're not going to be able to rendezvous with that particular. Actually, actually, you can. Not, not the <laughs> spacecraft I showed you though. There's a little impactor that you just leave, and that impacts with the asteroid. And that that's already been uh, demonstrated today by the high boost missions. And they're impacting at two kilometers per second. Sometimes uh, the impact velocity is high here, but sometimes it's lower as well. So you have quite a wide variation in that differential speed. So that's a really good question, and it is a huge problem. Then the follow-up to that, if you have something impact, how, how can you use that in the mind if you aren't able to return it again? Or oh, you can return the data. You can't return the impact of it. Okay. Yeah, so you just buzz out the data. And because your space is quite close, it can be a reasonably low-power unit, um, <coughs> and yeah, just being started for a short amount of time. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, and then, I guess maybe you own it because you've got something on it. It's like finding a flag, right? <laughs> it's like a... a 
trying to put a flag on it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Maybe it should have a little flag there. But you should know that Australia is a signatory to the Moon Treaty, which disallows that. True that, yeah. Okay, so we're like, we're like we're nine countries that signed it. Um, Wait, it is. <laughs> so now we're a rogue state. It's the OST, yeah. It's the OST that stops you doing it. Yeah. It's not the OST, it's called the Moon Treaty. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a good conversation for another time. All right, thank you. Thank you, William. Thanks, everybody.